thank you for joining us today. I'm Angela Johnson, the founder and co-CEO of Coalition of Black Excellence, and this is Know the Hat, CBE series focused on providing real insights on social justice issues impacting our community. And I'm so excited to announce our legal contributors for this series. First, we have Keith Lamar, former Deputy District Attorney, immediate past National President for the National Black Prosecutor Association, board member for National District Attorney Association, and owner and managing partner of the law office of Keith Lamar Jr. LLC. We also have next up Ayanna Lewis, Penn Law grad, former corporate lit attorney in big law, now assistant director, school district of Philadelphia's Office of Strategic Partnerships, and co-chair of Penn Law Alumni Board on Inclusion and Engagement. And last we have Nadine Jones, a Howard Law 2003 graduate who works as an antitrust attorney for big law for several years and then moved in-house at a global logistics company first as a regional compliance officer and corporate counsel now nadine serves as the executive director for the initiative advancing the blue and black partnership i'm so excited to get this conversation going because our community is hurting nadine let's talk first about brianna taylor what's what's been going on with her case i'll hand it over to you and keith Thank you, Angela. So there's been a lot of activity, a lot of talk, a lot of news coverage on what is uh, going on with the Breonna Taylor case. And so we want to use this opportunity to lay out the facts. So we'll be working with Keith to help lay out the facts of what really happened. And then we'll, we'll go through it uh, and, and have the story evolve in terms of where we are today. So Keith, can you lay out for us um, just what are the basic facts surrounding this case? No problem, no problem. So, hello everybody, and once again, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna make sure that we break this down into plain English, because we can speak lawyer terms, but there's no need if you can understand what's going on, all right? So, let's start off with this case. The incident happened on March 13th. And when I say the incident, the day that we all know the police officers came to their house with a uh, warrant, and then in, uh, basically everything, all hell broke loose. Um, they had, uh, they shot about 20 shots. They shot about 20 shots. Then you had the, um, before they shot those shots, her boyfriend um, shot off trying to protect the house, which he was legally justified to do. Um, he was arrested at the scene. Uh, from that point on, nothing really happened. It was a very quiet time, but luckily they had some uh, pretty good advocates in their corner and then the world got to hear about this case. Uh, it wasn't until May that they actually opened up an investigation on her death. Um, the boyfriend's charges were dropped from the police on May 22nd. Remember, I told you this case happened on March 13th. All right, so it took that long before they realized to drop the charges against him, against the police officers, and they were trying to charge him with aggravated assault. Uh, from there, uh, Brianna's law passed in June, but there's still no, you know, arrests, no charges. Uh, still protests going on. It wasn't until then in August, the first time that the AG met with the mother of Brianna Taylor, that very first time, remember this happened in March, it wasn't until August that they met. And then not until recently, March, uh, September 23rd, that they had that grand jury hearing that we all know about and why we're here talking today. And I uh, can't wait to break all this down because it's a lot that needs to be broken down so that you understand what's going on, especially when, how did we get here talking about those warrants? Keith, when you mentioned the warrant, I've been looking a lot at the no-knock warrant myself. Can you break down what that really looked like and how that played into the facts of the case? Right. So first of all, with a no-knock warrant, I was going to be really clear with you all. And I might tell a little joke that doesn't mean I'm not serious, but this was not Bin Laden. Why do we have a no-knock warrant for a person that's not a criminal suspect in anything? This is a case in which they're supposed to go to her house to find potential evidence of drug use or um, money that was from the drug sales of a prior boyfriend in which she had not been with for over three months. So a no not warrant doesn't even seem justified. I'm not sure what the police said to the judge to make, the, make him feel as if he needed to sign off on a no not warrant. Um, but at the end of the day, when you're doing warrants for a police officer, all you have is the police officer and the judge. So the judge is solely dependent on what that officer is saying and hoping that the officer will be truthful, and then you can challenge the warrant, but only after it has already been executed. 
So what do we know about what happened uh, when they got to the, to the house? So I know you've already recited the facts, but there seem to, there are competing yeah. accounts, right? Of what Definitely. happened, the boyfriend's account and the police account. So could you go into that for us? Right, and, and this is important, um, ladies and gentlemen, understand that there's two different stories here. Now, what should have happened is everybody should have had a body cam on and we wouldn't have to have this discussion. But look, it, for some reason in this particular jurisdiction, they chose not to have the body cameras before this happened, which is very shocking considering they have a bad history already. But before I get too off topic, uh, the boyfriend has a different account from what the police said. Uh, the police come in and they're saying that even though they had a no not warrant, they announced themselves, I guess as a courtesy, you know. But the only person that heard that was one neighbor, allegedly, uh, there were a lot of other people that were witnesses out there, multiple people. Um, nobody else can confirm that they heard the police say anything. And the one guy that said that he heard it, he said he felt like he was coerced into saying it because they asked him a whole lot. The boyfriend, uh, his story right there is he heard a loud, knock, uh, a loud knock on the door. And then he said, who is it? So did Brianna. Nobody responded. Another big knock. That's at this point they're getting up scared. Like, who is it? Who is it? Then boom, the door flies open, and that's when he had grabbed his gun and shot. Now everybody agrees that the first bullet came from the boyfriend. The issue with that is he's justified in shooting that bullet because that is a home on which he was staying, and you have the right to defend your home in Kentucky. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, before we get too far, before before I go further than that, why were the police there with a no not warrant, and then? do they really have the real sufficient grounds to even get that warrant? And I don't know what they said to that judge, but that is mm -hmm. something that we're not privy to. So we don't have that information. We would have to guess on what he said to the judge. But I, unless he told the judge that Breonna Taylor was some super killer, I don't understand why it would be no knock and not in the middle of the day. Because it was an, a search warrant. A search warrant for a person that's not a suspect should not be executed at midnight in which this was executed. All right. So if you're not going to arrest anybody. Why are you searching my, why did you choose midnight to search my home? That's not common. Uh, I've talked to a lot of officers about that. If it was an arrest warrant, so be it. All right. Cause an arrest warrant, you're trying to arrest somebody. You want to go to the house or wherever their location is when you think they might be there, but a search warrant that, that just doesn't seem feasible at midnight. Uh, the boyfriend also stated that once they shot, it was a multiple shots. Nobody ever came to aid Miss Taylor uh, and that's pretty evident considering they never really got inside the house until way after the circumstances. The boyfriend had got arrested before they walked inside the house and found Miss Taylor. So they didn't get inside the house at all. So I, I guess I just want to make sure I understand. Um, you know, we have all these these facts, Keith. You're you're a prosecutor and you're looking at this. What's sort of the approach and the options that a prosecutor would have and what are the the key facts that they would hone in on that would make them decide, you know, this is a charge we need to bring, you know, against these particular people or persons. Exactly. So what I see here is, a, a, I guess they've already kind of been, um, I guess, kind of prejudiced a little bit as far as how they feel about the whole situation. For instance, I mentioned that the boyfriend was arrested at night. Charges weren't dropped till May 22nd. They didn't give him the opportunity to say, well, did he live there? Was it a reason he shot back? They didn't give that opportunity to him. As far as, as, far as the police, the investigation didn't open it to May, which is ridiculous considering the lady was killed in March. That's ridiculous. That's not normal. The investigation should have happened the night she was killed. That's, why, that's when the open investigation should have started. Somebody has been killed. The investigation should happen the same time you find out they have been killed. And how long did you say they waited here? Uh, then they didn't open up until May. So you're talking March to May. So that whole time period, nothing is going on. No investigation. Evidence is getting old. And I know you all watch First 48. That's really important. That's real life. They, your real evidence is in those first few hours after a crime has occurred. All right. So that's when you're going to get all your evidence. The more and more time that goes by, the less evidence you're going to have. So in here, the prosecutor should be looking at well, how did we get to this house? You know, why were the police even there? That's the first thing. Were, they access, were their actions justified in how they went into the house? And then what were the people that were in the house doing to deserve to get shot? Did they deserve to get shot? Uh, what led to these accounts? Were any laws broken? And at, at the end of the day, what was the underlying charge? And for me, there is no underlying charge for anybody in the house. It's literally just a search warrant to try to find if there's any illegal drug paraphernalia there or cash at the house. They were not going there to make any arrests. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so just to touch on something that you just said, so you said the first 48 hours are critical, right, to collect evidence, but it's critical if you have the intent to prosecute, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I just That's wanted very to important. put that out there. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, and I, hope, I hope they caught it because uh, you put it out there perfectly. That if you have the intent to prosecute, then yeah, you're going to be all over it, in which they were all over that gentleman, her boyfriend. They right. arrested him immediately, charged him with aggravated assault on a peace officer, attempted murder on a police officer, and he sat in jail. Like, not for a couple hours. He sat there for over a week. All right, mm -hmm. so they was intended on prosecuting him to the fullest. He was questioned. They were trying to make him say, you know, why were you shooting at me? Are you in a drug game? So they was trying to prosecute him, even after they already have killed the young lady in the house. They're, so it shows you their focus. Even though there's a young lady in the house that has done nothing wrong that is dead, they're still questioning this gentleman into the wee hours of the morning about whether he's a drug dealer and what, what, what was his purpose. So yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting point. So, because um, I believe you said in the beginning that that they knew that the person that they were actually going to the house, the, the, the ex-boyfriend, that mm -hmm. he wasn't at the house, right? Is he that... was already arrested. He was actually in custody. They knew he was in custody uh, before they even went to the house. So he was arrested earlier that day. And so with those facts in mind, as a prosecutor, I'm wondering, okay, the guy that we're looking for is already in custody. Are we still going here with, with no, you know, no gear. When I say no gear, I mean, they didn't identify themselves. They were playing clothes. And we're going to kick in the door at midnight for a search warrant of some money? And is that, pretty, a, is that pretty unusual in, in plain clothes? Yeah, that plain clothes thing seems a little off to me. Because even here, uh, I'm here in Atlanta. And it clears I'm not in Louisville, but it got SWAT gear. It says SWAT. So you know when the, when the SWAT comes to your house. Everybody knows it's a SWAT. It's a big SWAT van outside. Everything mm -hmm. says SWAT is huge, it's, it's loud for everybody to see. And I would think that'd be even more ur urgent if you're gonna do a no-not warrant. Because if it's right. a no-not warrant, and let's say he had an AK and killed everybody, y'all gonna arrest him for killing everybody? He didn't, they didn't have any clothes on, they just knocking in his house. So that doesn't seem fair on a fundamental level because if you come into my house and you don't even have a police, you're not identifying yourself as police, mm -hmm. and I shoot you, then you're gonna charge me for killing a police officer in my own home this doesn't seem fair from a legal aspect or a moral aspect. All right. Um, could we move into now the charges that were actually laid um, in, in the case, not against the boyfriend in the first instance, but what actually transpired months later with charging of the officers? Can we go into that for a little yes. bit? Yes, so that right there is, is really, it's concerning as well, because at the end of the day, you see that he was charged with wanton endangerment, all right? So a lot of people wonder, like, what is that? Is it wanton soup? What is this, right? It is wanton endangerment. This is basically reckless conduct, all right? So what the prosecutor said, and I'm going to read this for you all, he said, Kentucky law states that a person is guilty of wanton endangerment in the first degree when under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to the value of human life. He wantonly engages in conduct which creates a substantial danger or death or serious physical injury to another person, right? That's what the statute reads. Now the okay. family wanted a, a manslaughter charge. No, they never said, let's go for murder. The family was very clear on their intent of, we want a manslaughter charge. So against let's check all out. Of the, against all of the officers or? or, or well, I mean, definitely against all of them, but definitely for the person whose bullet was the oh. leading factor that caused the death of her, right? Mm -hmm. So and that, and remember, remember that, the bullet that actually caused the death, not just a stray bullet. The family Last wanted the road, person that right. killed her, their family member. They didn't want to get the person that shot through a wall. They wanted the person that killed their family member, all right? So let's look at what second degree manslaughter is in Louisville, Kentucky. A person is guilty of manslaughter in the second degree when he or she wantonly, same word, causes the death of another person, including but not limited to situations where death results from, this, from a person's actions. Mm. Now, I know a lot of people are not attorneys. That's okay. But I think we all have a little bit of understanding of English language, right? That sounds like something we could have went after as well. Meaning if I'm acting wantonly, this is the same word they used for the wanton endangerment, but I caused the death, I can be charged with second degree manslaughter. For me, you know, and I'm not, I'm not this gentleman, but that seems like something I would have wanted to go after, especially looking at all the civil unrest that this case has caused. I don't mm -hmm. think that everybody in the world 
is for AKA, as you say, tripping and don't understand because they're not from Louisville. Everybody understands what death is. Everybody understands that they don't want a family member killed in the middle of the night while they're trying to sleep. So mm -hmm. when I look at this, you're saying a person is guilty of manslaughter in the second degree when they act wantonly causing the person's death. Well, then that seems like something, a charge that would be added. So in a normal case, prosecutors stack charges. Have y'all ever heard of stacking charges? Anybody? Y'all heard of that? Yeah. All right. So when we say stacking charges, right, I might charge you with, um, let's think of a, like a burglary, right? But I'm also charging you with theft by receiving stolen property, theft by taking, okay? Those are all smaller subsets that are, could be included in burglary. So if I miss the burglary charge, I still can get you on the theft charge, right? So therefore, what the prosecutor could have did was charge the second degree manslaughter. And if the jury doesn't find that you're guilty of manslaughter, it might find you guilty of wanton endangerment, right? That means you charge this, and if the jury doesn't find it, we'll go with the lesser included offense, which is what they could have done, but they didn't even go after this manslaughter, and that's a little concerning considering the code looks to be the exact same facts that you need to prove. Hmm. And just to jump into Keith's point, when you are looking at the definition of wanton, which is a person consciously and is aware of a substantial risk and they disregard it, right? If we know the definition of wanton, and when we hear some of the language that was used from the interim police chief talking about um, Hankinson when he said that he shot the conscience to the way that he shot up the neighbor's house, and you can only imagine that with presented all the facts that a jury could look at what was done there and say, mm, seems to be that there might have been a blatant disregard for the risk there, um, that they were aware of certain risks in the way that they shot up that house and they disregarded them. So just to Keith's point, for that not to be included as a charge seems just to be um, really inexplainable. Right, and a prosecutor has discretion, I understand that. And you know, as prosecutors, we do have discretion, but that's something where you have to look at what's going on and you see that it's the same, like, it's the same factors. So why are we not going after that? There's a woman that is dead. What they really charged this gentleman with because the other two officers have zero charges. And the other officer, not the one that's charged, because the one that's charged did not even shoot Miss Taylor. I want everybody to understand that. So the one that's going to go on trial, he's being charged for shooting through an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, explain, explain that, please. So mm -hmm. he's going to trial because the way he shot, he's basically, in so many words, and I'm not going to use a legal uh, terminology here, he's going to trial because he missed. And he missed recklessly, right? If his bullet would have hit Miss Taylor, we wouldn't be talking about want of endangerment, I guess, with these people, because the people that actually shot Miss Taylor are, are not even suspended from the force. They're not even, not, no charges, nothing. So they're at home, they got a normal life. This gentleman did not shoot Miss Taylor. He actually shot, missed. He missed wildly and he went through two different apartment complexes and he's being charged for the apartment complexes that he went through. So if you listen to that clerk that was reading out the charges, she was saying apartment number C this and C that. So he's, he's not charged for, nobody's charged with anything in relation to Breonna Taylor's death at all. So there's no charges that relate to her death. This charge is for literally shooting through the apartment complex. And the reason he was charged with that, they say, is because the curtains that he shot through were closed. It should have been open line of sight. Can we explain that a little bit too, though? I think it might be helpful for people to understand that their argument as to why they didn't include the charge was because they felt that the self-defense language in the Kentucky law would have prevented any kind of manslaughter or murder charge because they were acting in self-defense based on the premise that Walker shot one of the officers mm -hmm. um, and that they you know, had a, a, a round that was fired and they were acting in self-defense. So that is why they argued that those charges could not be brought. But I think it's important to look at what was, you know, a grand juror that was supposed to be provided with all the evidence that could have made that determination. Um, but just wanted to raise that as to why they presented it as though they could not um, charge Cosgrove and Mattingly for those murder charges. So I'm not saying it would be an open and shut case. It's going to be a case in which you would have to try and, and prove your point. 
So that's an argument to be made. But at the same time, if you're going to not charge those guys, why are you charging the other officer? Because the only reason he did his shots, even though it might be more reckless than he missed, he didn't shoot it until after the shot was fired. So at the same point, if that's a defense for those other guys, it's the same defense for him. He didn't shoot his gun until after the boyfriend shot as well. So he didn't come to the house, unlike the other officers, and do something different where he just came in and he shot before everybody else shot. His access took place after he was shot at as well. So if that's going to be your defense, he got the same defense that other people got that weren't charged. Absolutely. So quick question, and I haven't been able to confirm. And um, if you don't know the answer, then that, that's fine. But do you know what the race of the neighbors for whom their life that was almost taken by the reckless shooting um, for which, you know, the charges were laid? Do you know? I'm not a hundred percent sure. I've heard rumors, um, but I haven't seen them, so I can't say I know for sure. But okay. I heard that it was a um, Caucasian descent for one of the neighbors, and then there was a baby involved as well. Um, that was in one of the apartment complexes. Okay. Well, let me ask you. Um, so we won't speculate about why the life that was almost lost warranted charges, and the affirmative defense of self-defense didn't mm -hmm. apply to that in that situation, but. Um, but what could the prosecutor have done for the sake of transparency? I mean, a lot of what we, the frustration that we have is that it doesn't make sense. Mm -mm. Are you a lawyer or not a lawyer? Um, and what could have been done differently so that it so, can make sense to us? Uh, you know, what I think he could have done, and this is, I'm speaking on what I would have done. So you understand that in this position, you have a very powerful role, all right? And you know, a lot of people are depending on what you have to say. So let's just be straight out the gate, be very transparent. All right, this is what I've been presented. And he could do this. So it's a choice. So it's not like it's a law that says, hey, you can't tell the community about what you want to present to the grand jury. He doesn't have to tell the community, but it makes sense for knowing what's going on in all the civil unrest. What is your goal here? Is your goal to be a public servant or to be a police servant? It's two different things that you need to understand. So you serve the community and your community is unrest they upset people are it's protests it's things on fire there's about two or three other gentlemen that have been killed in your city due to these protests so the first thing you should have done is lay out the facts we shouldn't be guessing what you presented to the grand jury we should know for a fact what you presented to the grand jury okay you represent the people in your community and the people in your community are more than just the blue i love i have a lot of officers that i love love them they're some good guys okay but at the end of the day if it's my job to be the district attorney or the attorney general for the state, I don't just represent them. I represent everybody. So I have to go out and say, how do I calm and de-escalate this situation? They talk about all this training. He needs some training. De-escalate. Show the entire world what you have. Now, if everybody needs to see the facts, as he said, you know, you're going to hear celebrities and all that. Well, then I don't want to hear from the celebrity, sir. I prefer to hear from you, but, it, but you weren't saying anything. Right. So I had to hear from the celebrity because we went from March and so you didn't meet with the family until August. This lady was killed in March. You're supposed to meet with her immediately. Okay. Immediately. And I understand you're trying to gather all your facts. That's fine. But some things you must do as a human being that I think should be right. Meet with the family of the victim for the entire world is protesting saying, say her name. And you're out here just dilly dally. You know, it's like, you got to understand that your role is a public servant for all people. That's rich, poor, white, black, red, blue. It doesn't really matter. You are a servant of the people that live in America and is, that live in Kentucky for your role, right? So if you're the servant, please de-escalate this. Show the people a PowerPoint presentation. I have this, 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 and this. These are the charges that we're going to go for. I hope we can win. It's very mm -hmm. simple. This de-escalated. But if you're trying to hide something, and you keep doing it this way, now people are having to wonder, well, I guess what's happening? And you're going to start having people say this and people say that. And it's like, you're causing this chaos. You see a fire, and instead of coming with water or with a fire extinguisher, you're like, ah, uh, where's the nearest gasoline? Let me pour that on there. And that's what you're doing by not giving people the grand jury information. And now they're trying to get the grand jury information. And you're still trying to withhold the information. I think you got to stop that because it just doesn't look good. Even if, even if it's all right and everything is the way it should be, you're opening up the can. You know, you're opening up Pandora's box for us to think mm -hmm. anything we want to think. You can end right. this today. 
Yeah. Um, as a former prosecutor, I'm so sorry. As a former prosecutor, Keith, if it were a criminal, a known criminal who was killed in, you know, uh, altercation with the police, would you have met with the family right away, or only if it were if it were a victim? Uh, well, as a prosecutor, we probably only meet. Yes, yeah, so we're only going to meet with the victim if it's proven that there this is a case in which they were a victim. Right, so if you got a case in which you got somebody okay. driving reckless and they get out of the car with a gun and they start shooting off at everybody, we're not gonna meet with that person that they end up getting killed. We're just not gonna do it because that person That's was right. already doing the most, right? And you think about the guy in South Carolina after he shot up the church. That's not normally how things are resolved if somebody has shot up a church, right? You're not gonna take them to eat and woo woo them and say everything's going to be okay. Normally that person, that's the no-not person right there. That's the one you go in and you shoot 20 times, like he needs to calm down, all right? That's the person that you need to do that to. Um, mm -hmm. But when you see that case just like this in which you walk into the building after all the chaos has happened and you find a young lady that has been killed, shot seven to eight times, and she has done nothing wrong, and you know this now, even if it's a mistake, honest mistake, you still need to meet with them. I'm not saying you come in there immediately and say, I'm going to put the officers in jail, but you meet with her. You talk to her, you explain that, hey, this isn't right. I understand that something has happened. Let me investigate. It shouldn't take until August for me to meet with the family of a young lady that's been shot eight times by my police force. Yeah. No, that's so that's so powerful. And I think um, that kind of gets to to your point that, that and the, the point of the series, you know, why our community is hurting so much, right? Exactly. And Jan, mm -hmm. I, I, I know you've done a lot of research in this space, but um, just... What are, what are some of the, the practical takeaways that we have here? You know, some of the, the policy implications that, um, you know, as people are kind of digesting all of this information, you know, what can we do with it? Yeah, and there's a lot to digest, but I think I'll just start with one of the key issues that's come out in this case, which is the no-knock warrant. What happened with it? Why was it seeming to be botched in the way that it was? Why is it allowed? And we can just start with looking at the history of no-knock warrants, right? So they really started um, the no-knock warrants around the Nixon era, this war on drugs. And we know in many instances, war on drugs can be covert for war on poor Black folks. And so in many cases, these no-knock warrants were used specifically within communities of color um, under the guise of what needed to be done as a part of the war on drugs. But when you look at Fourth Amendment law, right, first, these no-knock warrants were supposed to be only done under a reasonable suspicion that if an officer was to knock and announce themselves, that that would put them at danger. And we see in this case, there was no evidence in the affidavit or anywhere else that led us to believe that Brianna and her boyfriend were in any way a danger or that they would have obstructed evidence. There was nothing that would lead us to believe that. So we can already see how they're used in ways that would be unconstitutional. And when we're looking at now what's been done in Louisville, they banned the no-knock warrant. And there's been efforts now to try to ban those no-knock warrants on the state level. And legislation has been put in place to try to ban them at the federal level as well. And so I think it's just this overall cry, um, the public cry around the militarization of police and their enforcement of policies in communities of color that are unjust and that lead to results like Brianna and her boyfriend um, where the force is completely excessive when we're looking at what they were stating they were trying to accomplish. So I think first we can talk about the need to look at these tactics and policies that came out of the war on drugs that um, criminalize Black folks and that lead to our death and to our imprisonment at such high levels. And so there is advocacy that can be done around the no-knock warrant if you're in a state where that's not currently um, outlawed. And so also we can look at some police accountability policies that have been scrutinized as a result of this case. So we're looking at body cameras. As Keith stated, if they had on body cameras, we wouldn't be questioning whether they announced themselves. It would be clear. We would have that on tape. And so there's a lot going on around the need for police to have these body cameras so they can be held accountable. We're also looking at documentation. We saw that the police report after all this time came out and didn't say that Brianna had any injuries. 
where we know that she bled out on the floor after being shot up. So how were they able to have a report that indicated no injuries and no forced entry into her home? So there's an issue with accountability around what the police are able to um, state in documentation that is supposed to lead to us being able to figure out what actually happened. But what we saw here is where, you know, there was a complete breakdown in that process and no one was held accountable. Um, I think one other area to look at is where we're talking about um, policies that would lead to no knock warrant EMTs needing to be on the scene you know, now they're saying, well, when we have these kinds of situations, we'll make sure that EMTs are there, um, which granted could have saved Brianna's life, but are we okay with a system that has policies in place where an EMT is necessary to maybe get some drugs and money out of a situation? Is that where we are, where we know that it could cost someone's life because they are looking to raid a home for drugs. So I think that raises, raises a larger question again about what we think is okay when we're talking about um, you know, police discretion and law enforcement in our communities. So these are some questions that I think a lot of folks are asking. Um, and I think one other point that's too big to talk about in this show, but I hope we revisit, this is why a lot of people are talking about an effort to defund the police and looking at ways to prioritize funding and ways that support mental health, social services, and different ways of de-escalating situations as opposed to police presence because we see what it can often lead to in our communities. So again, a conversation for another day, but all of these points do point to a lot of the arguments that are coming out of the defund the police movement. And yeah, I, I agree. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Keith. Oh. I was going to say, if I could jump on the defund the police, I mean, there's a lot of talk about it, um, but the only, um, how do I say this, the only one, the only person that I know that has already issued an order to defund in the area, presumably of law enforcement, is the president, President Trump, with defunding all anti-bias training um, that's to be done with federal dollars, right? Um, presumably, I mean, you've got some local police agencies, I believe, that also receive federal dollars. So I would think that they would not be able to use those federal dollars for anti-bias training. And I can't help but think that anti-bias training would be uh, really, really critical at this time, especially in this particular case, not just for the police officers, interestingly enough, and I'm sure I'll get a lot of backlash about this, but also for the black prosecutor. Because why was Brianna not a victim? Right? Why did he not see her as a victim? Uh, I have to believe he saw her as a criminal, which is why Definitely. I asked the earlier question. So some anti-bias training, just so that we can work against and understand our biases and how we can neutralize them, is not, this is not the time to defund that critical training in the area of policing. So I just wanted it, to, to add I that. I love that. I love what you said. That makes so much sense. And that's kind of what I was saying. When you talk about anti-bias, it's like, first of all, when I was a prosecutor, and this is just, people are human beings, right? So if you see criminal activity every day and you hear people lying to your face every day, because that's what happens a lot. They lie to your face, all right? So you can be a little jaded. So you might need some counseling. You might need some training to get your mind back right, because everybody you see, you're thinking they're a liar. They're trying to steal from you, because that's what you're dealing with every day. You got to understand your environment is a lot about who you are as a person. And if people realize that, they'll understand that you need that type of training and counseling as a police officer. Because if I'm risking my life every day, now I'm overreacting on things I shouldn't overreact, right. right? And I'm not saying you're a bad person for that, but that's just what it is. If somebody's been hitting me every day, so you come to me like, hey, keep what's up, high five, and I'm jumping, right? The reason I'm jumping is because I've been getting hit in the face every day. That don't mean I'm tripping. I'm just used to getting hit, so I'm trying to defend myself. So that type of training needs to happen because when you're a prosecutor, you start looking at people saying, well, they drug dealers anyway. You don't mean no harm, but that's happening in real life. And you have to be aware of it. If you're not aware of it, you're going to keep doing it. And now you're going to look up and you're going to have an innocent person in jail. If this didn't happen, Brianna Taylor's boyfriend would still be in jail waiting trial for attempted murder on a police officer. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that, and, and they would have been prosecuting that to the fullest. Oh, this, we don't have enough facts for the grand jury. Would not have happened. All right, because he was already in jail. He already had bond and charges. And y'all didn't even drop that until May. 
So what I'm saying is we have to understand that, hey, we're not trying to call you a bad person because like I you see my thing in the background. That's, that's a badge. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a badge back there. I'm not saying I hate the police because I don't. I mean, police are cool with me. I want to be safe. Right? I'm in this home talking to you all, and I feel safe in this home that nobody's going to run up on me because I have some security. Right? But at the same time, I don't want to feel unsafe that the police are going to run up on me either. I can't take both. All right? Because if the police going to run up on me too, then that's what I'm supposed to do with be, 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 be riot. So don't create the problem and then be like, oh, why are you mad? Yeah. Right. You yeah, shot me. Just a quick, just a quick <laughs> note on that. Um, I think that's also something that comes out of that conversation when we're talking about the funding, not necessarily abolishing the police, but just ensuring that there are social services and supports and money that's prioritized differently, right? So we saw in LA, $100 million that was directed from the police into the communities. And we're seeing that there are ways to bring in social workers, is what they're looking at in Louisville now, bringing social workers to mm -hmm. go with officers as their dispatch. So it's looking more holistically at how funds can be used differently to respond more appropriately. To not buying tanks, right? Because we buy tanks out here. You know, I'm not sure what man gonna beat up the tank, but they be buying tanks. Right. I agree. The thing about Louisville is you see what they did, right? You got the Brianna's Law, you got an interim black female police chief now, you got all this stuff that they're trying to do, but it's like, are you really doing anything? Because the last time I checked, Nobody was arrested for Breonna Taylor's death or even charged or attempted to be charged to our knowledge. So that goes back to the transparency that we all must have. And then we must, as a country, learn. This should not happen again, but it will. And that's the sad part because we'll say, oh man, but we don't have body cameras up in Montana. I'm not saying Montana has anything bad going on. I'm just using that as an example because if you see this is going on in Louisville, we should do it here in Georgia. Do not let that happen here. All right. If you see that going on in Georgia, in Florida, hey, Take note, did y'all see what happened in Georgia? Let's not have that happen here in Florida. So for every state in the whole country, y'all know what's going down in Kentucky right now. So if your police force doesn't have body cameras, then do you really care? Because you can stop it. I don't wanna hear the excuse of we didn't know. Yes, you do, you do know. Like we gotta stop that. You know exactly what's going on. If you're gonna, go, if you're gonna break into that break in, if you're going to execute a search warrant, you should have a body camera. Right, you should have something to protect you. Cause what if I go in there and say, "Man, that officer took ten thousand dollars from me." How you gonna defend that? Oh, I do. He's just a liar, and then they gonna believe I'm a liar because I'm a criminal now. That's not right legally. We got to set it up better than that, and that's what the technology's for. Mm -hmm. Put the body camera on now. When somebody say you beat them up and you really didn't beat them up, it can protect you, right? Because in all honesty, that body camera helps police a lot. All right. So now you can't have that random person say that this person's acting out because you have it all on camera. So I'm a concern that y'all didn't have it considering your history in Kentucky of profiling. All right. And it's a it's, it's record of it. Right. So y'all should have been first to jump on board and say, we ain't profiling nobody. Check my camera out. I ain't profiling. He did run a stop sign. That's why I pulled him over. You know, it's just, it's common sense. I just wish people would start to use it. We got to stop being political about it and just, just do the right thing, okay? Like I said earlier, you represent all parties. I don't care if you're Republican. don't care if you're Democrat. And if, I don't really care. I don't care if you're from Mars. I don't care. As long as you follow these rules and that we can live in peace with one another, all right? And it's very simple. We have technology. For the police, we have to trust you. For the DAs, they got to trust the DAs. You got to trust your AG. You got to trust the people that you have in leadership. So don't do things that cause this mistrust. And right now, by holding off on the grand jury, not want to talk about what you got, all that, that causes mistrust. Duh. Wake up. Duh. It causes mistrust. So just do the right thing, man. I know that you don't want to do it, but you got to do it. That's why you're a leader, right? Leadership is hard. It's hard, right? But you got to do it. I got to expose, I have to be vulnerable as a leader because I'm going to make mistakes. Like I said earlier, we're all human. We are not saying you're perfect. You will make mistakes, but you must be vulnerable in your role as a leader. You must be vulnerable to be a police officer. You're a little vulnerable, but that's what you signed up for. And to that point though, Keith, I think also in looking at what is unprecedented here is the fact that because things were so cloudy and the ball seems like it was hidden so often, we have a case where a motion was just filed by a grand jury to release all of the evidence that was pre presented to them. You said is, by a grand juror? 
Yes, the grand juror who filed a motion for <laughs> the AG to release all of the evidence and transcripts of what happened in those proceedings because there were so many gaps in terms of what seemed to be what the AG presented as what the grand jury decided and said, oh, we only charge this one, you know, officer because this is what they decided. And this grand juror is saying, well, wait a minute. We weren't presented with all of the evidence. That's it. We, didn't wow. have, we didn't feel like we had the opportunity to maybe charge what manslaughter to. And we it, know that the grand jury is typically going to go with what's recommended because they aren't legal analysts. So they might not be thinking of what else could be charged. They're going to go off of a lot of the recommendations. And so we have an unprecedented case where a juror is saying, wait a minute, I don't think I was presented with everything I needed in order to make an accurate call on what needs to be charged and who needs to be charged. Mm. And that, that's got to be looked into. I think, see, that's so telling. You're telling me that a grand juror, somebody that was in the, in the room, okay, in the room is saying, I want y'all to see what I saw. That's to let everybody alert, alert, issue, problem. And then the DA is saying, I don't want to show y'all yet. I don't want to show y'all yet. Uh, that's going to cause all kind of chaos, man. Duh. Y'all got to stop. What do y'all think is going to happen? If I got a grand jury telling me that this happened to them and the prosecutor saying, you're not willing to show me what happened to them, yeah, my mind is running wild. And I think it's mm -hmm. rightfully so. Thank you, Angie, for putting this together. Uh, see, this, this is the brainchild. I'm not going to say it. But uh, <laughs> this is the brainchild of everything. And um, yeah. I think that this kind of conversation needs to be had because hopefully people can hear this and understand this. Have a conversation uh, with one another. And I think that's how we grow as a community. Conversation is going to lead us into the future. And if we continue to go down the path that we're currently on, we're going to be looking like Rome, falling. So we need to need to go ahead and get together while we still can yep. uh, and make things right. Because at the end of the day, I think that America has a lot to offer this whole world. We have a lot to offer each other. And if we, if we start offering peace and blessings, we might get peace and blessings in return. But if, yep. somebody, if somebody dies every time, you're going to have a very bad response. And I think that's, if you look at these debates, we have to think about that. You ask for peace for protest. There's only so much peace you're going to get when somebody keeps dying. Think about a child in kindergarten. If, if he gets hit by another child, you say, hey, don't hit him back. You apologize. But if that other child continues to hit that child, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be a fight one day. So we got to stop that. We're adults. Let's start acting like it. But speaking of the fight, I'm sorry. I know we're at time. And I'm sorry I had a little internet problem. But I just want to mention, because I think it's so important, that a lot of this came to the forefront because of folks on the ground, grassroots protesters who yeah. made this an issue it was going to be swept under the rug and they weren't having it and one of the most outspoken uh i think instrumental activists in this fight to keep brianna taylor on everyone's mind is tamika mallory and until mm -hmm. freedom has done amazing work they practically moved to louisville camped out and said we're not going anywhere until she received justice and so i just think it's important to acknowledge the work that the grassroots protesters have done to yep. make sure that this issue is addressed and to know that you know, giving to Until Freedom is a way to make sure that these issues continue to get um, the, the attention and due process that they deserve. And that's a perfect note to end on, Ayana. Definitely practical way that you can get involved immediately. Uh, thank you, Keith, Nadine, and Ayana. This is Know the Half. Tune in for another session um, as we continue to provide you all updates on how to address issues that are relevant to our community. Shouts out to Maya Moore. Uh, you took off a whole WNBA season to release a free man. Uh, that's amazing. Shouts out, hats off to you. Nobody else would have did that. You the woman. <laughs>